This is Frank Rodriguez Viela, and this is part of my uh, a series that I'm going to be doing, which will be including uh, teachers uh, and also um, also the lessons, which will be uh, be called um, "So You Think You Want to Play Guitar." But one of the things I wanted to do was really start introducing teachers that are in different parts of the country. And today I, I'm I'm lucky to have uh, Dale Turner. A, uh, an instructor at MIT here in Los Angeles. And so I'm just, uh, you know, we got to meet, we've known each other for a couple of years now um, through my crazy little products. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> which is true, they're crazy little products. Uh, but uh, I'm just, I'm, my heart is so much into people that teach, you know, because uh, after my, my, my life here in Los Angeles and I moved back to Texas, I started teaching. And so it was a nice to, to get to meet you for sure, you know, because it was something, one of those things that when you reach out and communicate to teachers, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good vibe. It's, it's a, a good feel. spirit. So, thing. I mean, yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask was like, what inspired you as far as just to even play guitar? Oh, man. Well, the number one thing is always the music. You know what I mean? If you're listening to music and you're, you know, at whatever age, uh, it, it, something might light a spark to where you actually want to participate. <laughs> and uh, it's possible someone in your home or an uncle may have one of those instruments around so you're aware of it before you even know really what it sounds like. At some point, you make a connection with, oh, wow, these songs I've been listening to, the sound that I'm so familiar with is can be made by this instrument, whatever it is. So at some point, uh, whatever the instrument is, guitar, bass, drums, piano, um, I actually started on piano and then, which is a funny story, which I could tell you really quick. Yeah, a, yeah. a friend of the family when I was in first grade was just ripping uh, like a boogie woogie version of uh, Flight of the Bumblebee and it blew my mind. So. Uh, we somehow had a really cheapo piano, so I got lessons with, on that. Uh, then eventually trumpet somehow happened for a little bit. But when I got way into the rockin' type stuff, the music I was listening to was not represented necessarily by a trumpet or piano. So I got the guitar thing happening, basically. Yeah, as, as a teacher, I, can, I always run into uh, great guitars like yourself have that background on piano and also horn instruments like trumpet. I've, I've seen uh, have a lot of uh, people that have played trumpet. Were you able to connect the trumpet to guitar or anything or, or was just mainly in the reading part of it? Well, weirdly, it's hard for me to remember how I gravitated towards trumpet. I think uh, this doesn't really happen very often nowadays, I don't believe, in public school where there is a music program where they have orchestral or symphonic instruments that at young age become available, like the school is equipped with a bunch of instruments. Uh, where I was growing up in fifth grade, somehow you were allowed to trumpet, saxophone, trombone, whatever. So somehow the trumpet became a thing that I was way into, but I, I can't really remember why, so it's kind yeah, of embarrassing because yeah, yeah. I kind of obliterated it with other instruments. No, no, that's good. Yeah. But I didn't want to be a trumpet player until I got braces, oh. which just destroyed everything, yeah. and uh, <laughs> which was too bad. It was a physical thing. It was physically tough. Yeah, it was, it was painful, and I did have a tone that, according to you know instructors, was actually pretty good tone, happening. Good tone. Yeah. And, and so at that point, like you, I just you made more of a transition to guitar. Eventually the guitar started happening, still a few years down the line, but I started drawing guitars. This is, so I did have a, a uh, fascination with the appearance of them, which I don't know why. So I would draw pictures of guitars. Uh, like a lot of people at that age, I started to have, you know, pictures on my wall of oh, nice. people you know, rocking rockers um and i was also like a lot of kids that kind of get pulled into that and go way deep i don't know if i was a loner but a little bit of that to where uh with other things that were happening 
uh, the stars aligned and when a guitar entered my life, yeah. I was way able to take the deep dive and just, that's kind of all I did, except I still, you know, did schoolwork and yeah. all that. Did you feel the, the structure of piano and trumpet helped your guitar play? Well, anytime you're, you have the experience of uh, having a short-term goal, whether it's something, you know, a task a teacher gives you, like it, as a first grade piano student, you know you're supposed to do this, they want you to practice X amount of minutes per day. You Back then, I think I even had a book that had like, you write in how many minutes you practice for and each date. A log. Like 50, exactly. A log. So 15 minutes or whatever each day. But the, the cool thing with that is from an early age, you know that there's a payoff for the, for the work. So you start off with something you can't do, you chip away at it during the week, by the end of the week, you can do it. And just that type of process, yeah. you never lose, you know right. what I mean? A routine, the yeah, routine. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's, to me, that's the kind of thing where when I see um, people, when they gravitate to, uh, to another instrument, and guitar can be an instrument that's just so fun to play. Mm. I mean, obviously, it's a it's a fun instrument to play, but sometimes it does it has it doesn't have the rules. So did you figure that? Did you feel that this is not like trumpet? This is like an, I can. Yeah, it became there was, well, yeah, with, with the trumpet. Uh, I mean, it's a certain fingering per note, so you it, it's a little less common to be playing a note and not be aware of what the note is that you're actually playing because you associate a note on the staff with the fingering as you're initially learning. But guitar, you can approach, anybody can approach it and at least make some kind of sound out of it. Right, right. And you learn certain physical things. Some of those you can also move around without having to modify anything and all of a sudden, whoa, it's you know sounding cooler and did cooler. Did you get a teacher? Did you get a, a guitar teacher? I did, yeah, pretty quickly. Um, and I did the same thing that, you know, back, back in our day yeah. would probably be a common routine for a, a music instructor at a music store, which is what it still kind of happens. You get an instrument in a music store, there's a teaching studio attached to the music store. That person's available for either 30 minute or one hour lessons still happens to this day. Right. So I hooked up with a fellow uh, who was a jazz guitar player, but I didn't know at all. I just, there's my guitar teacher. Yeah. So I'm going there with the Mel Bay book or similar thing, right. and you you know you learn the first three frets in each string from high to low, following you know Yankee Doodle or whatever yeah, the tune is that's written out, <laughs> um, and then some chord grips. Eventually, that he would show me that would be different from what was in the Mel Bay book. So it wasn't just the book; it was supplemented by other things. But at, at a certain point, um, I did. I didn't. Rebel is not the right word at all because I really liked him. But I so much was, you know, into stuff that was more rock oriented mm -hmm. at that time. And he, I'm not sure how old he was, but he's maybe in his 70s. Maybe he's much older. At the time. Yeah. Um, and so I eventually quit. I think after one year of studying with him, and then I just did my own random stuff. Um, but then, way later, what happens, uh, the more experiences you find yourself in, the more walls you crash into, realizing you can't get over this wall until you learn this, this, and this, or something. So and eventually I realize, you know, I kind of wish I still did study with him, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. But anything that you get from anywhere, you're still moving something forward, right, right. so. Uh, but you had a good it, relationship with your teacher. Oh yeah, com yeah. completely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would still go to that music store, and, hey. Yeah. Um, yeah, and weirdly, one of the early rock guitar teachers, what ended, at least what ended up happening back then for me, is there'd be the older, person in your school, you know, like a several grades right. higher than you that Upper was already time. burning. Right. And then you'd beg them for lessons for like peanuts. And and so they were into that. So I had a few teachers like that that were the upper class person or whatever you'd call them. Wow. And crazily, one of them is in Everclear now. 
the, the band, which oh, is kind of random, He's super crazy, awesome guitar dude. I remember him showing me like Jakey Lee and Uli Roth and oh, cool. Warren G. Martini and everything. And that's cool. So anyway. you had you had that uh, that's an important part. That part of the less or that part of working with him. How was that like as far as what was he like? Was he show? Was he telling you this is how you do it, or was he just was he saying listen? listen to how this sounds. I mean, what was his, his approach? I'm having some interesting flashbacks right now relating to that fellow. I, I think at that point, maybe he was going to community college actually. And he started studying theory himself oh. at that school or local community college, whatever. And then he started to kind of, I remember I first learned the order of sharps and flats in a key signature from him. Uh, with a you know sentence, a mnemonic device that right. people inevitably learn. Um, he was probably the first person that explained to me what relative minor was. So for every major key, there's a minor key that shares the same key signature, stuff like that. Um, and we there's a little bit of notation stuff, but it was mostly about solos that he was already working on for himself. He would then check this out, and that was awesome. Yeah. Just so back then, nowadays, everything's transcribed. Everybody has a YouTube video breaking down this passage for the last, you know, many decades. Yeah, yeah. But back then there was no, not to date myself, but it was not that easy. You can date yourself if you want to. <laughs> okay, thanks man. Uh, okay, well, I mean, cause uh, I'm, I'm, and that was, that was the next part I was gonna ask you, like what year was, about what year was this? When you discovered this part of the, so you were, as a young middle school kid, you were more with the piano and the trumpet, and then you moving on to... This the is definitely an 80s, 80s. era okay. thing, yeah, for sure, okay. um, which is, I mean, all I listened to would be like Scorpions, yeah. Iron Maiden, Ozzy, right. Van Halen, right, right, right. Dio, you know, right. all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that had been when those records were coming out. Um, so when it was a, the, the it was what was coming out at that time. Sure, the yeah. 80s. Okay. yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. Like, I don't want to say how early, but pretty early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So there, the the resources for people uh, to learn anything beyond the the basics, where you start to get more interested in specific styles and other technical things, was a little bit harder because you were at the mercy of random instructor at a random music store hopefully they know how to help you go where you're where you think you want to go there were guitar magazines back then started to pop up that would have stuff like that um which i you know totally like, like crazy with like guitar world guitar for the practicing musician okay, for got sure it, got it, got it. Uh, guitar player guitar world for me happened a little bit later and crazily i don't need to say this but I ended up writing for all those magazines like years later, which made it kind of funny because the people that were writing articles on styles that I liked, like Wolf Marshall and Andy Allador, they were a huge motivation for me to become literate, I guess, like oh, yeah. learning about notes and how to write and you know, break down rhythms and transcribe. Um, which that was a, there were not that many people like that. There were rock oriented players that were able to notate and describe and present things to people that are wanting to soak up that kind of right. stuff. So that was really, that was a hugely inspiring thing, oh, which yeah, is kind of yeah. weird because no, it's, no, no. it's more about a, instead of being inspired by a style or a sound, it's in, being inspired by an actual like resource, like, yeah. which is, and that did pull me down a whole path of study uh, somewhat related to that. So it was more the notation. Is that what you're talking about? Because I know Steve Vai used to do it. Steve Vai Yeah, he, he started it. as a transcriber and then ended up doing charts even for Zappa before yeah, yeah. he even got into Zappa's Before he started Zappa playing. Yeah, I, got yeah. I got to um, meet him really young. Oh, when awesome. He, when he just moved out here and so he was working for Zappa. And yeah, he was doing so a lot awesome. of writing. So yeah. I remember that I would call him up and he goes, oh, I'm doing this chart right now. Oh, okay, well, well. But he had his trio. Band. So the nice thing that you have, uh, which is sort of nice because we're, we're talking about the structure and the things that people were organizing at that time 
or other musicians. And mm -hmm. it was through, yes, it was through, probably through, 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 I guess through Tab and Guitar Player, right? And guitar Player Magazine. The, the big ones for me, would, for, that, for that specifically, it's probably guitar for the practicing musician. Okay, there it is. Because weirdly, if you, if you, and not to make this overly like a time capsule thing, but back then, nobody yet had devised a system to notate how to use a whammy bar, how to do certain things with harmonics, certain things with bends, pick scrapes, slides, all the guitar specific phrasing things. And so those guys were kind of the ones that mapped it all out. Um, and a lot of that is stuck to this day with how you notate all that guitar specific electric finger nuance, touch expression right. stuff. But that would be on tap, right? I'd be both. I'm both. Yeah, standard notation and tab. Yeah, okay. yeah totally all integrated. See, that's good to know. I mean, it's just like I'm, you know, it's like I'm learning. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm aware of uh, a lot of the things that were done, and I would always just listen to it, you know, and then just sort of figure sure. out. But there always were people who needed to really know. So as an instructor, when you do things for your students, do you use a... Uh, do you use notation or do you use tab or what do you do? It, it kind of depends. Uh, a, 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 I don't know, interesting is the right word, but a development that m maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, Guitar World eliminated the standard notation from their transcriptions in the magazine. All right. And so it's now only tab, but with rhythm notation attached okay. to the tab numbers. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, of course, worked for them also for a million years, mm -hmm. um, even through the transition into the tab only with the rhythm thing. Mm -hmm. And because I had to do it, uh, I noticed that that like, made it almost twice as fast. Oh, wow. So a huge part of if I'm transcribing something for a student, since a lot of them, depending on their background and what they've studied up to that point, uh, they have almost no problems with the tab numbers and the rhythm attached to it. Uh, and the notation on top of that, if they're looking at it, you know, it's it, it depends on the style of music right, and what right, it is. Right. But the main thing is to give them what's going to get them up and running quickest right. instead of sitting there for an extra two minutes because I want to notate it with standard notation. If I just do the tab with the rhythm so that there it is, uh, then you can Interesting. do even more stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, because I know even, even in the YouTube uh and there's a lot of great tutorials where actually where they're playing things. And I get Brian Shirell's one that does it where he's playing, and I don't even know if it's the actual, just the melody or his solo, but it's right on top, right on top mm. yeah. in time. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. That makes sense to so many people. And in guitar, you, you know, our, our job is to teach people. Yeah. And it has to be with whatever it's going to be easier. And times are different. I mean, the notation part, it's always nice. I, I always love it because I use it and I, mm. and people want that. But do you, what is the uh, percentage of people that are reading, say, uh, of your students that would? Well, I do teach a bunch of actual reading classes at Musicians Institute. Mm -hmm. And once you're there, uh, I mean, the more you swim in that world, the better chance you have it, you know, getting the hang of what's truly involved to actually be able to read. Right, right. Um, but I also have a bunch of private students that have nothing to do with Musicians Institute, and they might be in like Brazil, Russia, Italy. Right. So they're just doing, you know, they're serious, deadly serious, but at that point in their life, they're not overly concerned with the reading part. Yeah, so they know. it's whatever gets the vocabulary to make that style tick for right. them uh, assimilated. But verbally, the theory thing, I'm super hardcore with. Okay. In a presentable, not overly wordy and pointless way, but so that everything is categorized, uh, so that in their brain, they develop a filing system for all these different approaches, okay, concepts okay. and things. So the theory thing is 100% there. Okay, good. Um, it's just whether or not see, you see the note versus knowing the note just in your head. Yeah, it's good to know. It's good to know uh, that, you know, that you've organized it that way. That way we can, you know, you know steer people in your direction because you know, we'll be putting your... Uh, the link to your website and all oh, that stuff. Net. Yeah, so that will be, you know, 
And it's always nice because I think in reality, people need as many approaches and in, in many ways to play and to learn how to, what it is musically. When people say the theory, I know people shy away from the theory. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Poison. But am, am I right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many, I don't know if myth is the right word, but uh, stuff out there, misnomer, I don't know, yeah. uh, that studying theory is just going to kill my creativity, like that kind of ridiculous thing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can just toss out a thing that I used to do to combat that thinking, which is pretty interesting. Uh, also, for many, many years in these magazines that I wrote for, I also interviewed like hundreds of major league rock star legend Guys. freaks forever. Yeah. Uh, and one of them, I mean, all of them have their own thing, but I've interviewed John Frusciante several times for like giant cover stories and all that. Right. So most people that are aware of who he is with the Chili Peppers and his own solo uh, solo record catalog, um, they would think of him as super creative, super inspired at all times if they know anything about him. And so one of the interviews that I did with him, he went, everything he did was explained in theory terms, everything. And he constantly has it in his head as he's interacting with Flea when they're jamming and improvising and coming up with parts and layering whatever Flea's doing, he'll play this particular note in relationship to that. So he's totally aware of what's going on. So as that particular interview was unfolding, at some point I got him to break down that uh, stereotype or bad rap theory has developed of it killing creativity. And he said this whole thing about how that was a crock and made it really obvious how he used oh, nice. theoretical understanding just as a way of categorizing sound yeah. to his advantage to control his creativity. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to read it. So what I used to do yeah. anyway for my theory students at MI in the very first quarter is I would photocopy this particular interview that I did with Frusciante. Oh. And first week, they're reading that. So if they had any of that, it's going to ruin my style type of garbage. Well, if you read straight from the this fellow's mouth, how obviously that's not the case, yeah. maybe that helps them be more open to that type of stuff. And it pretty much always worked. It's pretty oh, cool. That's, a, that's nice to know. I mean, I, cause I, I, uh, I have respect for the the longevity of that band. Yeah. And in, in the, and the, the, the guitar sounds I really like. I think they're very, um, um, very pure. You mm. know, I always hear, you know, I, I love what they do. Um, and they're always requested. You know, I do a, a program for a rehab program in Texas. And Chili Pepper music is always very... Oh, right on. Yeah, it's very requested. Hmm, interesting. You know, yes, <laughs> and throughout, I mean, I've been doing this 10 years now, and there's never... I, oh, can, can we learn a Chili Pepper song? And so it's just... And I teach it. I sort of show it, and, you know, it's... Uh, I explain, you know, that there are definitely good musicians here. You know, hmm. there's like, you know, it's... Um, and sometimes, yeah, there is that other... The, like the rap you say people get that you know you know this is like uh, we don't do this we're just doing that but reality there's a lot of thought behind it and yeah. theory helps just to just organize it and and theory can be I'm almost I'm not too sure I mean this is how I feel theory can be how you organize music for you you know I've heard uh, Pat Martino back I went to a clinic mm. years ago probably in the late 70s and uh, and he just talked about certain things, and, but he named things his own way. That was his theory. Yeah, he had some interesting yeah breakthroughs. That but he, but but I, I like the fact that you said it in rock because I mean hmm, people, yeah. you know, because my 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 students and people that are into guitar will will pick up on those those artists, you know, from hmm. Flea to um, I mean from Chili Peppers. And there's there's other you know there's other other bands too, but they're obviously probably number one requested. Wow, music, that's pretty so. cool. So and then so the, your teacher, the one that was showing you the the more I guess um, you mentioned the different artists. He oh, made. back in the high school yeah, era, yeah, yeah so with the eighty uh, yeah right? learning Jakey Lee and so Lee after Rod that and, teacher, did you go on to somebody else, or you just felt you had enough? To understand. Well, at some point, 
Uh, oh, here's a interesting development, getting back into hitting a wall type of thing that is inevitable. If you're constantly reaching and discovering new styles of music or new uh, opportunities present themselves. Uh, again, public schools nowadays don't know if this exists, but uh, back then in Washington State, we had a jazz band in our high school. There were two jazz bands. There was Bonehead Jazz Band, <laughs> and then, you know, monster level sophisticated jazz folk. Yeah. So the, I somehow found out that there was a band that rehearsed crazily early in the morning that, as a legit credit for the school. Um, and I knew they had bass and drums, and then I discovered normally they would have guitar, but they didn't. So I got in there, and this is when other stuff started to happen, I guess, uh, where I started to diversify my learning, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess because of that first guitar teacher I had, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, where he was jazz-centric, and at mm -hmm. some point showed me some voicings and following a chord chart, just kind of plugging in the grips type right, of thing. Right, right. Uh, the charts, of course, for this, what was basically a jazz big band. Oh, I just had another weird flashback. Sorry, this will be. This might be hilarious in a second. Yeah. Um, so there was a book of, you know, they'd say, let's pull out this tune, put it up there, chord charts, playing chords. Well, some of the songs had solos. And if you're coming from a key center rock rock background where yeah. it's just one key seven notes and that's it at the most uh so you can kind of have a shape and muck around and at least hit something that's passable right uh this i immediately realized what what's going on because the constant key changes you know be a couple one bar and then off into some other realm and whatever i was playing that for two seconds sounded okay now i'm just trip you know drowning right. so uh that cracked open a whole other world to me where I, all because i'd never really realized that that was a, a thing uh i didn't realize that people playing that music were actually improvising i thought every solo ever was composed because typically for some of the rock things that i was into the solo when you see them play live they're kind of playing the same thing most of them yeah it's constructed uh, yeah, and so at some point, from a bunch of people that I met and talked with, uh, it dawned, I mean, obvious now, but I did not know what real improvising was. I knew I could mess around and it was just a thing, but the solos that people were doing in songs like that would be different every time, and they're nailing the changes, which I didn't even, again, know what that meant. So that uh, eventually pulled me way far away from the, mm. the rock thing for a while. Right. But the way I got into that, I don't know if this is worth even talking about, uh, I did start to learn of rock players that started as rock players that then went deep into jazz, like Mike Stern, oh, yeah. Scott Henderson, oh, yeah. Schofield, all those players, Holdsworth, which wasn't, that's a totally different, not related oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, category, his own yeah. mute thing. Yeah. But uh, Mike Stern specifically started off as a rock player. Scott Henderson started off as a rock player. So I heard those players, and then I heard the extra stuff, and also Steve Morse about the same time, and somehow I just ended up going that way, and then I just, that opened up the next thing and the next thing in terms of like learning and study. So right, right, right. The, con the connection, how, yeah. how they, well, you know, and when, when Chicago had Terry on guitar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he was like I when I listened to him, we're talking about early, I guess with a band, yeah, mid mid, mid to late sixties where it mm. really starts to take off and develop something. And it was a lot of it was he was, he sounded so there was that pop thing, there was that rock thing, and it was just a connection. And there's a it's a great uh, documentary on him. Oh, I don't wow. know if you've seen it. It's I uh, have it. Uh, uh, I think it's it's like a, they had the Jimi Hendrix Experience documentary, hmm. but this is a Terry Katz of, uh, from Chicago. That's awesome. It's a great. It's I, I saw it not so long ago, but it just explained wow. he had sort of a rock, a rock, um, probably more a rock background, but he could do a little bit of everything. He's, hmm. He was very eclectic. He was very. Uh, 
but he would have the guys do the charts for him. You know, he yeah. had the ideas. Everything was mapped up here. Hmm. So like we're talking about in theory, people will map it up. They'll say, okay, I got it. Is this what it's going to... And they'll know. They'll know. Um, it's uh, sort of amazing. There was a... Uh, you know, there's just different ways people organize things. On guitar, since it is sort of considered folk, a folk hmm. instrument, it's always backed up people for years. And it's all like a backing. You talk about the chords. Hmm. But once you... Once you uh, and so Segovia. <laughs> but uh, so at that point, so at, when you when you're learning all this, uh, when you took a little diversion into the jazz, did you get another? There was there a teacher involved there, or were you were you doing it you're on your own? I definitely. Well, actually, I did because I still lived in the, the, the Seattle area, okay. so I did hunt down a few teachers. Uh, and then spent some time trying to find the right fit, but I still didn't really know that I was being presented stuff in a, for lack of a better word, bogus way for that type of study. So I did find somebody that was a jazz player, uh, but the lesson would be me just playing chords for him while he just you know, oh, yeah. unload it over and you're not, and then at the end of the lesson, I'd get a sheet of arpeggio shapes on a grid. And yeah, I guess you can kind of learn how to play them up and down, but you don't ever learn what it is. how it relates to anything, yeah, yeah. which I still see people get trapped into all yeah. the time as far as their own practice routine. They go up and down these arpeggios, G major seven, G seven, G minor seven, G minor seven flat five, G diminished seven, but they don't, if you ask them why they're doing that, they can't give you an answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, that's it. Well, it's like it's like a, it's like people who learn chords. You know, you have a chord. Uh, I say your ultimate chord dictionary book, and then, mm. oh god, it was, what is that diminished? Oh, it looks like this. So you 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 figure it out. But I always feel in chords you got to do the actual progression number one. Or the cadences that yeah you got to apply connect, it to something yeah well you connect it and so you have to have a, a particular idea of how to put together because I'm older what? I'm older yes what? yes I'm older uh, we used a bit and it was really funny because when I moved out here it was like in '79 into Los Angeles and so uh, are you gonna say chord chemistry no it wasn't okay. chord chemistry though I, I got to meet 10th grade yeah which was same nice. here got to sort of hang out we had two lessons and uh, uh, we all had the same book um, Mickey Baker oh yeah the, the yeah. yellow and black yeah the yellow jazz and black. chord book yeah chord book okay. it, yeah it was so it was like it was sort of like what everybody had because there was just not that much Mm. There was even this is probably before obviously the Berkeley series of books. Yeah, the Will Levitt. Well, I, well actually, and this is like uh, I don't know. Well, it's uh, most of that stuff was Jack Peterson. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Jack Peterson was the guy who did most of that writing. Interesting. Yeah. So that's <laughs> a, but it's just uh but the fact is that you know there was people organizing it for uh, for. I don't say for rock guitars, but just for organizing it for guitarists hmm. who wanted to yeah. learn that. So, so you got your, you have your. That's, that's nice that what you're doing is it's also theory based, and making sure that the student right understands that part of it too. Well, l- l- luckily, uh, b- because I've been in the musicians' institute world for so long, like over twenty years, they already have a theory class so i already know that they have something you know to attach this stuff to sure and i taught all the theory and you're training there for 15 years i suppose um so there's already they already are swimming in that info so it's not like i'm hitting them cold with all this gobbledygook right yeah right um it's organized you have a, yeah it's structured and I think that kind of stuff is good if you have a if you first I mean it makes it a little bookwormy and stuff on paper only but at the end of the day uh, chord spelling and voice leading is like probably the main area that is practical as a player what chord am I playing over 
What are the notes in the chord? Do I know where they are on guitar? Once you eventually get that happening, then you have a foundation to stick all sorts of cool stuff to, whether it's rhythm guitar stuff, soloing type of things, whatever. It's like reading. Yeah, it's like, well, it's like it's like putting the guitar in the order the way piano is. Hmm. The piano is is able to do all this. He's always, you know, and once a guitar can do it, it's always. But you think it's yeah, like, sure. And then of course the the thing that always comes up that obviously you'd be no stranger to this fact: piano, you know, one note. Oh, it looks exactly the same up here. Yeah. Same up here, and then guitar is harder. Of course, because we have like six different pianos, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and none of the notes look the same. The, the range is overlapping. Yeah. So to get beyond just the physical only stuff, uh, some kind of organized approach hopefully happens to learn, you know, what's up with the fretboard right. thing. Th there's a regular thing I do find myself saying quite a bit uh, is. Anything that's just only physically learned, a lot of times that's the first thing that gets forgotten. If it's just a physical only thing and there's no connection to it at all with something else, uh, it, like you, a, a lot of people will learn solos when they're little, younger, and have no clue what the chords are that they're being played over. Uh, it's just a physical thing, but then they never really, then they start to wonder, well, how come none of this stuff's coming out in my playing? thinking that they just learn a solo and it's magically what they need. Yeah, they, they learning how to dissect that stuff, um, right. I'm kind of getting off. No, 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 but it, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's the connection of, you know, what, um, it's the theory part. It's a theory, if that's sort of guiding you, then it helps you, because obviously progressions are the same progressions because you don't even have these different keys, right? <laughs> but if you go to different wise. keys, and so here now, if you if you can apply it and connect it, oh, when I do this, I do that. When I do mm -hmm. this, but you have to be able to do that. That's connecting connecting those dots, you know. So, well, I mean, yeah. it, it's sort of cool. I mean, I like the fact that you know you you know you you. I mean, I, I knew you were there. Twenty years now. Am I? Am I? Yeah, it's my twenty tooth. Twenty second, twenty second year, crazily. So uh, I guess, and then people, people can look up, look you up in. Uh, you have your own website and everything. Right? Yeah, my freakishly outdated website is uh, intimateaudio.com, but I have a YouTube channel with a bunch of your instruments. Oh my! Instrument. I mean, at least your contra <laughs> and uh, other oddball. Okay. Yes, instruments. That's right. I've seen it. Yeah, that's Which, okay. if if you don't mind me, not to keep the theory thing going. Okay. But I will for one more second. Okay. Because I do have a crazy instrument collection, and none of them relate to guitar. I mean, a lot of them. I do have students. How are you able to play so many different instruments? And it is because yeah. you, I know what notes are by name in my head. I know what notes work against these chords. I have vocabulary that. It's pretty specific that mm -hmm. will fit one style or another or something. Plus, hearing it, you know what it is. Exactly. It, it just becomes a matter of okay, well, where is that note on this weird instrument? And once, and even if I have to write it on there, you can pretty much immediately make music on that oddball instrument. So, as yeah. an extra, like layering my own recordings or session type junk. Yep. If that has made it way easier to be able to express myself oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on some oddball instruments, just yeah. having the theory. I never thought of that. Jump. I mean, I do it because I play other instruments too. And uh, when I do it, it's okay, where's that? Okay, where's, it's that A, oh, it's that A, okay. And mm. once you connect it, then, uh, especially if it's, a, if it's a different instrument. If it's guitar, you know, you can, you can tune, you can retune. Mm. But if it's a, a, a bona fide, like a ooh, or if it's a, a charango, or if it's a mandolin, or if it's a, an instrument that really, say like a sitar, there's hmm. got there's a breakdown there, and the theory comes in sure. right away. So. Or a hammered dulcimer, which I use pretty <laughs> regularly, which is like 83 strings, okay. but they're like triple and quadruple, right. and across the bridge in the middle, it's a fifth jumping right. each time. And if I didn't make a cheat sheet, where I have like a strip underneath with the note names, It'd be a nightmare, but once I can see it, it's instant. 
because it's no different than looking at a piano keyboard because you understand the names anyway that's so nice that's a nice connection because that that helps to to even you know when people want to learn other stuff because once you start on the guitar i always say the guitar can be a real like the what piano is to the orchestra Hmm. you know the guitar can be that for the fretted instruments being whatever mandolin banjo you know and actually it, it all comes from banjo a lot of it comes from banjo it's amazing it's true so, well i mean and you, go ahead. and you mentioning ted green earlier who basically was like treating the guitar like an improvising keith jarrett type oh yeah piano player on the guitar yeah. he was awesome you know amazing. he's an amazing player him and uh and the old pioneer um and we mentioned this thing van uh, epps van epps short yeah. van epps. and so and the late great Joe Diorio who just passed. Oh wow. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, the Ted Green, uh, obviously in like two thousand five. Yeah, you got it more back. So yeah. Well, I mean, I wanna thank you for on that. On that, note. I mean, that yeah, that's that nice. Yeah, let's talk about death. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean it's uh it's, But those, those legends are important to because there's still stuff for, you know, young guitarists mm-hmm. to that would not know of people that have pushed the envelope in the, you know, the depth of the guitar yeah. as some of those type of people. Well, so maybe that's cool interesting thing to... that you said about Diorio and Van Epps and, and people, I have to say this, I'll be even of Segovia is that they had not just the passion to play, but they had the passion to organize, you know, they, were, they were organizers. I mean, and, and that level was pretty intense. I mean, cause Van Epps, people that knew him at his prime would, would comment like you know yeah at the time when you had all these great players so obviously Barney Kessel mm-hmm. and Joe Pass and they'll mention other great players and when they mentioned Van Epps and then there's Van Epps mm-hmm. so there's obviously they felt there here's was all these great players but then there was these guys that sort of paved the way for a lot of other people yeah and it might have been in their uh, books because I know they had other books that that uh, that uh, I know. The Van Epps had, I think, the Mighty Triad. Yeah, Triad. huge volumes. Yeah, volumes, of stuff. volumes of stuff. But I think he had other books too. So, but uh, which, since we're talking about education, I still regularly get riled about the, bump, you know, toxic bumper sticker of those who can't do teach. Oh, all the people that you just named are like the deepest musical people who've ever been on this planet, right. who also happen to teach right right trying to help out people yeah yeah i think so and, yeah. and ultimately you know we're obviously talking about people that are you know legendary people on that instrument you mm-hmm. know people that are you know van epps joe diorio segovia people like uh you know there was lenny bro who also yeah, was a yeah. great there, there's just been michael hedges was another mm-hmm. great great player Man. but but they these are people that created great textures, great sounds, and uh, and they were inspiring. And it's good, always good to tell the students, hmm. listen, listen, listen to these guys, because they're, they're, you know, they really had an interesting approach. You know, and it was musical, very musical. And then I think, I mean, and they, uh, they do come from other backgrounds. So you were talking about, just as you started, piano and, and trumpet, all of those sort of really to me bring in a nice uh a, a nice something in the mix that you're creating and you're saying oh wait a minute that's you 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 made that the reference to piano and once you see that that little connection because <clears throat> other you know piano would be still probably the main instrument for orchestration i talked to uh, sure yeah one of my sure. uh, my good uh, actually was a student of mine ed tribeck and uh, he was a great orchestrator. He was a great, yeah, orchestrator, great guitarist. And he, but he'll say, "But I'll I'll jump on the piano." Sure. And he just needs to. <laughs> yeah, the range. Yeah, he needs he needs to hear multiple this. Multiple. And so uh, and then so, but then I can see when uh, when Jimmy Page would do stuff, and so he, next thing you know, the guitar. Okay, I'm going to tune this one up this way. Yeah. So, Killer layers of guitar. Yeah, layers of guitar sound. Brian May. Along with tunings. Mm-hmm. So yeah. at the end of the day, for any student. I would say, or anybody, there's, you know, guitar has so many options. Yeah. The options of just having these little 
tuning keys yep. create tweakable. Uh, yeah, I you know I don't I can't remember the last time I saw somebody retune their piano on a gig. <laughs> Which actually I yeah, did know somebody. Does happen. That, yeah, I, I did know somebody that, but it doesn't happen, so but I want to thank you, man. I want to thank you for for doing this. I know it's. Oh, uh, thanks for. Yeah, I know it's. Uh, let me hang with you. Yeah, man. we we uh, we talk on the phone, and uh, it's always nice to to meet people that are making a difference and doing stuff. And you this know, fella right here. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm hanging out. That's all. Oh man. But, uh, so but I'm, I'm gonna. You'll have. Uh, there'll be information once you know. I'll uh, I'll have your. Uh, your web web information or yeah. your or and your, your your YouTube channel. So, oh. all righty. So uh, much obliged. Yeah. Thanks so here, uh, Dell Turner. Is there? Do you have a nickname? No, just the D. D. No, no. <laughs> yeah, there's been plenty of nicknames, but uh, uh, yeah, just uh, just Dale. Just Dale. Or as I was joking earlier, if you're from New Zealand, yeah. No, no, don't say it. No, don't say it. Either way, it was, I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Dale, yeah, thank you for, for hanging out. You know, and I, you know, next time I'm in LA, well, yeah, well, you know, once the streets are a little more open, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll have to hang, make the rounds. Yeah, we'll do something. So. All right, buddy. sweet. All right, man. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, thank Keep you, people.